We have completed <clears throat> the book of Hosea, and uh, we're moving on to Joel. I I'm debated whether to move on to a different subject, but uh, Joel is a pretty short um, book, three, three chapters, and it has a very important message when we get to the emphasis on the day of the Lord, and I think you'll find that uh, an important message. So, Joel, the day of the Lord, <clears throat> and this will be lesson one, <clears throat> the uh, locust plague and the day of Jehovah. So, lesson one, uh, let's look then at the prophet and his times. Now, if you remember Hosea, we spent quite a bit of time because God, God's message to Israel was knit within the life and marriage of uh, Hosea and his wife Gomer. Um, Joel 1.1, 1, 1, <clears throat> the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Now, Joel is a name of many Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word is Yahweh, and it means Jehovah is God. A pretty good name, Jehovah is God. A few have suggested that this prophet was the son of prophet Samuel, because in 1 Samuel 8.2, now the name of his firstborn, Samuel's firstborn, was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. However, the scripture here is quite clear that this Joel, the Joel of this prophecy, was the son of Pethuel, and uh, we don't know anything about him at all. It's the only time that word is used, and in Strong's 6602, Pethuel, meaning the vision of God. Uh, interesting, the father's name is the vision of God, and he named his son um, Jehovah is God, and God chose to use him for this message. So by contrast to the fullness of detail given in the life of Hosea, we know practically nothing of the personal history. There's a message in that, if you stop to think about it, that uh, unlike uh, the celebrity preachers that we hear of today, uh, the thing that was important about Joel is the message that God gave him. That the message was important, and he was uh, observing, a, 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 you know, he was uh, fulfilling a, a very important role. But that was not because he was important. Uh, God used him and used him well. Uh, uh, we find his prophecy quoted in the New Testament. Apostle Peter uh, talks about that on the day of Pentecost, but we'll get into that. Uh, from the prophecy itself, we may gather that he was a prophet of Judah, the, the uh, southern kingdom, that he probably prophesied in Jerusalem uh, because he makes note several times to the sanctuary in Jerusalem, noticing this in Joel 1, 9, and then 13 and 14, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. Uh, the priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. So uh, here the... Uh, often the, the repeated reference to the house of God does indicate that he's probably right there in Jerusalem. The um, uh, idea of this, and, and then Joel 2.15, blow the trumpet in Zion. Zion is the mountain upon which Jerusalem is built and where the temple was. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. All of this is something that you would do gathering around the temple. We think that probably Joel was one of the earlier of the minor prophets because we find that it, uh, Amos, uh, coming later, seems to quote him. Not a significant quote, but uh, the passage that we're looking at is Joel 3, verse 16 and 18. In verse 16, the Lord shall also roar, also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. I put that in bold that you remember that. 
he goes on to say, and uh, the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope or the place of repair, the harbor. Uh, you got an extra thing in there. Where is that? Harbor? No, it didn't go there. Okay. On my paper, I have number one harbor, but uh, anyway, the harbor of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Then in verse 18, and it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow or go with waters, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. Uh, we found that fountain coming out of the house of the Lord in Ezekiel as well. This is the, uh, the uh, new temple that is built in the uh, time of the millennium. So where... Uh, uh, where, when, how does Amos quote this? Well, in Amos 1, verse 2, he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. So this is a, a, a you know, dynamic speaking. And the, inhabit and the habitation of the shepherd shall mourn, the top of Carmel shall wither. wither uh, Carmel was known for its great trees, uh, but it will wither. And then uh, Amos 9, 13, Behold, the days come, talking about the, the restoration the days come, saith the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper. Uh, people are, uh, uh, the, the, the fertility is established, things are growing, and um, the treader of the grapes will overtake the one that is sowing. So they, they can't get out of the field quickly enough for the next one to come and get ready for the next. And the mountains shall drop sweet or new wine, and all the hills shall melt. The idea of melting here is flowing, and that seems to refer back to the idea of flowing with milk, which indicates uh, the goat and the uh, cow, sheep, uh, producing a lot of milk. Also, we find that the sins denounced by Amos and Hosea are not mentioned here, and then the sin of adultery, idolatry, uh, is uh, uh, not, not really touched upon at all. So the prophecy begins with just terse statement concerning the fact of the divine revelation and the recipient of it, it was Joel, and the message was from God, the Lord uh, Jehovah. One need only to compare this superscription with that of Hosea or Isaiah. Isaiah has a big introduction about his life and so on, <clears throat> in order to see the difference in detail. For this reason, we cannot speak dogmatically as to the time of the ministry of Joel. We just... Uh, notice that if he's quoted, then his uh, work had to be uh, out and in circulation and understood by others who were prophesying later. All right, um, the uh, uh, main focus here is the plague of locusts. Now, any Old Testament prophet you're going to find a lot of people who just rejoice in saying, well, that makes me think of this. And so they start interpreting the Old Testament uh, in a symbolic way. Now, the, God does use, and the prophets did were commanded to use symbolism, but it's always spelled out. It's always explained. Uh, it's not left for the reader to just make up what he thinks it means. Uh, you study it, and you read it enough, and you begin to recognize, in fact, what he's uh, talking about. So uh, we'll find here there's a difference of opinion among students of the book as to whether the first part of the book is to be taken as a literal locust plague or to be understood allegorically, that is, figuratively, of some future judgment. But here's where we stand on this thing. There are no hints in the text itself that the prophet is using an allegory. And God does that. He signals that this is a, a symbolism, see? So he doesn't do it here, so we must decide for a literal view. So what we're looking at is an actual locust plague that had devastated the land. And it's a plague because it is one swarm after another. You have one plague of locusts, and uh, that's bad enough. But then you can recover. But here we have 
one after the other. So the picture given in the prophecy of the locusts, we recognize it is true to the manner of action, the results of their blighting invasions. Notice, number one, the disappearance of the vegetation in the fields. These, uh, you know, millions of these things land and just eat, and then the whole field of vegetation is gone. The eating of the bark of woody plants together with the roots under the ground. Uh, they're known to do this. Three, their swarms darkening the sun, their compact march in military manner. It's like they land and then just take a step and eat, take a step and eat. Four, the wind-like noise of their movements, those wings, big wings. You know, locusts can be this big or bigger probably, but the wings make a sound and you multiply it by the millions and you can hear it. And then, actually, and how creepy would this be, the munching sounds accompanying their eating, the crunching of the, of the crops. So all of this, we have the records of locust plagues uh, in, in regular history. The comment here is, was there ever the like? Does anybody, do you old, old, old people remember anything like this? Or did you ever hear of anything from the people that are old in your eyes, you see? You know, old age is about 15 years older than you. That's, that's how you can figure that out. Joel 1, verses 2 and 3. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. This is a thing so singular that it is not to be forgotten. Um, you know, people talking about this what, climate change now. They gave up trying to prove global warming, so now it's colder or hotter, so it's changed. And... Uh, but, uh, you know, the weatherman keeping records will, will say, yes, it's very cold. The coldest was 1968, you know. So I don't know whether it's getting warmer or colder or whatever. So the prophet calls upon the old men especially to recall whether they have known any visitation in their time or in that of their predecessors similar to the locust plague, which has devastated the land by successive swarms of the locusts. There was no parallel to this judgment. And this is clear by the prophet's words that this was no accident that this agricultural society was answering for their sins. Um, and there was no, no memory by anybody living at the time of the prophet. They were to pass the story of it, for, uh, of it from generation to generation because of the severity of the destruction and, and this was the warning then, you see. Thus is the unprecedented character of the calamity vividly brought before us. It had never occurred on this wise before. Joel 1 verse 4, that which the palmer worm hath left, and uh, the Hebrew literally is the residue of the palmer worm, uh, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. So some have interpreted, the first time I uh, ever heard somebody discussing this, they uh, told me that this was, this was when the, the locusts come and they feed and then they lay the eggs and then the eggs grow, and it was this series like that. Um, so some have interpreted the four names as either four types of, different kinds of locusts, or four stages of growth in the case of one locust. But looking at the language, the prophet uses the common word for locust, as we translated it, locust there, the King James, and then gives three poetic equivalents. So neither of these views is tenable. Um, he was talking about the same locust, but he's calling them by different words. The names literally are the gnawer, the one who gnaws, the swarmer or multiplier, that's what the locust is, the licker, 
that's licking, not drinking, and the consumer or devourer, this last one. So the verse would read, The residue of the gnawer hath the swarmer eaten, that which the swarmer hath left hath the liquor eaten, and that which the liquor hath left hath the devourer eaten. <laughs> so uh, this is the picture. It's a poetic way of saying that they just kept coming. When you thought, well, at least we have something uh, left over, uh, no, not going to happen. Now, um, and, and why does he say it that way? Well, what the prophet means to convey is this, in the successive swarms of the locusts, what one portion of them left, the other portion is devoured. Now, it may be that there's, the reason he says it this way, God is leading him to emphasize the number four, four stages. Uh, we see this happening, uh, the number four, in matter of judgments. In Jeremiah 15, 3, I will appoint over them four kinds, four families, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to tear, uh, wild, hungry dogs tearing at people, the fowls of the heaven, picking the bones clean, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. Four things. Then again in Ezekiel 14, 21, For thus saith the Lord God, how much more, or also, when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome, uh, normally that means the stinking beast, uh, but evil beast, and the pestilence, to cut it off from man and beast. So four, uh, you think of a, you know, a table with four legs, it has stability, uh, four square, things are uh, firm and, and, and uh, stable. So there's uh, uh, God's four judgments. Some Hebrew commentators have tried to relate the four names to the four empires in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. But nothing in the text warrants such allegorical treatment. Uh, oh, number four, well, that means uh, the four kingdoms. No, it just means uh, God's judgment. If you compare Joel 1.3, tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, their children another generation, we see echoes of this in other times when it's pure history, uh, not, not a, a, a real prophecy of things to come. In Exodus 10, verses 2 and 6, And what thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son, of thy son's son, what things I have wrought in Egypt. God is saying, I don't want you to forget this. The whole Passover thing has uh, many meanings, but one of them is don't forget what I did to this world power of Egypt. Left it leaderless and armyless and um, conquered it. Uh, as I brought their slaves and my people out. So he goes on to say, What things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs, those, the plagues which I have done among them, that you may know how that I am the Lord. And they shall fill thy houses and the houses of all thy servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy fathers' fathers have seen since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself and went out fr from Pharaoh. Moses talking to Pharaoh. You're going to see something that nobody has ever seen before and that nobody will see again. So the idea here is uh, a memorable judgment here upon Egypt was said, tell you know, uh, the Hebrews, tell your sons and so on, and asking Pharaoh himself if you've ever heard of anything like this. So we realize the literal import of the words of the prophecy. Uh, talk about locusts for a moment. Locusts have rightly been called the incarnation of hunger. Uh, hunger come alive. Some swarms devoured an area of almost 90 miles, clearing every green herb and every blade of grass. It's just gone. The ground looked like it had been scorched by fire. So somebody said the locusts have a scorched earth policy of their own. Nothing left to rebuild. Many have confirmed Joel's description in their own accounts of the locust devastation. Uh, read the stories of them. and The sun darkened for hours as these things flew in. So we find that this is the fearsome plague, a plague of locusts, one swarm after another. Uh, Joel 1, 5-7. 
Notice what he says about this plague. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine. Because of the new wine, it is cut off from your mouth. Want to try to get that as in the mouth as soon as possible, you know. No, it's cut off. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number. It's like an invading army, see? whose teeth are like the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. It made me laugh to think about barked my fig tree. I uh, heard older men say, barked my shin on that table, you know, and I, I had no idea what that meant. But I realize now that it means take the bark off. <laughs> it's like banging the tree and knocking the bark off. So skinned his, skinned his leg. Barked my uh, fig tree. Uh, Hebrew laid my fig tree for a barking. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. <laughs> they had a dark bark on them and now it's all gone. So the prophet first calls upon the drunkards to awake out of the stupefying effect of their intoxication with wine. The drunkard, known for his song and maybe raucous laughter, is to weep because the locust plague destroyed his delightsome vine. The teeth of the locust here are likened to those of a lion and a lioness because the two jaws of the locust have saw-like teeth. They are made to bite through, even bark and so on. Um, like the eye teeth of the lion and the lioness, the jaw, jaw teeth. Both the locust and the lion are most destructive in their ravages. So um, you're bitten by a lion and uh, you know you've been bitten. He moves on then in verses 8 to 11. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Sackcloth is how you, you put on, it's like a burlap cloth. You put that on your bare skin so that you feel bad and itchy and scratchy. And uh, this is when you, you show yourself to be feeling as bad on the outside as you feel on the inside because uh, her husband has died. Um, and this is the virgin who evidently the, the husband is betrothed, but they weren't married. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. So not only the drunkards, but uh, he calls upon the people to lament like the brokenhearted uh, bride whose husband has died. And then the um, priests are to mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth. For the corn, they hear the word for grain, is, um, is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. That will be the olive uh, oil. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, you who are trying to keep the, the flowers growing and the, and the trees producing fruit. Howl, O ye vine dressers. Uh, all the grapes are gone. For the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. This uh, very often is where you have to uh, um, dig things up and replant and find new, new plants to do this because they ate it down, down to the ground and below. So if you notice, a lot of different mournings going on in this chapter. The one is the drunkards in verse 5 to the, the nation under the figure of a virgin having lost her betrothed in verse 8. The priests, verse 9, the land, we'll get to in verse, well, in verse 10, which talks about the field is wasted. And um, so uh, these things are languished. So uh, the land is mourning. And then five, the farmers and the vine dressers in verse 11. So God pictures here his people as a young virgin, his bridegroom died, and he exhorts her to lament for the calamity that has come. So pay attention to this. Uh, you don't just walk away and say, wow, that was something. <laughs> he says, think about this. Uh, as you and I look around our country and you see what one thing has devastated us, then the next thing comes, you know. If it's not one thing, it's another. And uh, with this, we, we need to pay attention to this, that there is a a precedent for this. It's a, there's a cause and effect thing in God's working. Um, 
Are you happy with the way God is dealing with you financially? Well, now look again. See, uh, are you are you happy with the, the the crop you have? Well, God can take it away. And uh, what what we actually should be rejoicing in is the the blessings of God. And if you are prone to say, I'll do whatever I want. Well, then you're going to take whatever God gives and whatever God withholds and what, what God gives and what he takes away. Um, you can choose, but there are causes and effects. And the effect here is God's plague, a plague that nobody had ever seen before. We move on then to verses 12 and 13. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate trees, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered. Because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. So why all this bitterness of, of weeping? The offering of the house of the Lord were uh, cut off. Here, uh, today, our worship is from our heart. <clears throat> we worship God in spirit and in truth. But their worship actions were offering animals and uh, grain and wine, the uh, fruit of the vine. They, these are the things. And this, without it, you could not worship God as he instructed. The things that they were to do were just gone. They had nothing to use. So the meal offering depended on the fruit of the field. The drink offering depended upon the produce of the vine. We come to the end of Joel 1, verses 14 to 20. So he says, here's what I want you to do. Sanctify ye a fast. Now the Day of Atonement, for instance, was a fast, not a feast. The others were feasts. There were celebrations, uh, sharing of food, and so on. But the Day of Atonement was where you meditated on your sin, and you fasted, and um, you um, mourned over your sin while the high priest was offering his sacrifice and sprinkling the blood in the holiest of, whole, uh, holiest of holies. He says, call a solemn assembly. And solemn assembly could be translated the day of restraint. There's not a day for watching the NBA playoffs. It's not, a, not the day for celebration, uh, chicken wings and barbecue. Um, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord, unto Jehovah. Uh, do you see then that this was not just a strange attack of insects? This was repercussions for sins done, hearts not laid uh, to God's care. Cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand. Now, let me just take a moment here to talk about this phrase, the day of the Lord. Uh, I kind of grew up reading the, the works that said, uh, here we find that the day is uh, allegory for the entire seven years of tribulation. Uh, the more I've studied this, the more I recognize that it's really better to look at this uh, for what it says rather than what they say it says. And I believe that this is the day of Jehovah. As he's using it here, he's saying this is the day of judgment. God has come to judge. And he's going to use this to refer to the tribulation period. But I want you to think of this. The, the biblical way of looking at this is that the day of the Lord is when Christ returns and brings the judgment upon the sin of the earth. Now, what leads up to it are the seven years 
of tribulation. Then he comes, and it follows from uh, after that, he establishes the millennial kingdom, actually building his uh, temple and establishing his kingdom there in Jerusalem. And then following that for the thousand years will be the millennial kingdom. So the seven years of tribulation, the 1,000 years of the kingdom, have right at the dividing spot the day of the Lord. And that day is the day of judgment. Now, that day of judgment then uh, is taken to see what comes before it and what comes after it. And so the references are logical. But uh, uh, this is the day. This is the day when, when the judgment has come. So that's the emphasis here. Uh, the day of the Lord is at hand. As, uh, as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of God is being cut off. The seed, the grains, is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate where you gather the grain, grain together, the silos. The barns are broken down for the corn or the grain is withered. How do the beasts groan? There's nothing to feed the animals. The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Where am I supposed to go eat, see? Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. They were dying off. O Lord, to thee will I cry. The prophet inspires um, people to do the same. For the fire hath devoured the pastures or habitations of the wilderness. Uh, this is that, that fire, that scorched earth policy of the locusts. Like a fire came through and left it uh, blackened. And the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up. And the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So one domino effect uh, affects the other. So desolation touched everything. Here he lists the field, the grain, the vine, the olive tree, the wheat, the barley, the fig tree, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree, the apple tree, all the trees. In short, everything had undergone the blighting effect of the locust scourge. No wonder the priests of the Lord gave themselves to mourning. The desolation affected even the worship of God's house. Let's consider then what, what, uh, what um, ravages sin can introduce into every realm of life. Uh, we're seeing now this new plague of uh, monkeypox. I found it just interesting that the, the leaders are saying, oh, we don't want to call it monkeypox. What, they're afraid it's going to offend the monkeys, I think. They don't, want to, they don't want the monkeys to have a bad rap on this thing. Uh, so they're going to call it MPX or something, CX, and just turn it down to initials so, uh, so the monkeys go along being happy. Um, but it, it's, it spread through homosexual relationships, um, like the beginning of the uh, AIDS virus and HIV. Uh, on this uh, month of uh, pride celebration, by the way, uh, the fact comes out that the diseases are being spread by the very thing that they're celebrating. And um, uh, the, the the foolishness of it all is that uh, uh, we're being told that it, uh, love, 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 it's all about love. I, I have news for you. This is not about love. I am to love the men of this church and the women of this church. That's God's goal for me. This isn't about love. This is about having sex. Let's just be clear. This is what we're talking about. Um, what's love got to do with it, somebody asked. What ravages sin can introduce into every realm of life? No greater catastrophe in the spiritual and religious sphere could have overtaken them. This meant practically the setting aside of the covenant relationship between God and his people. However, 
we need to recognize that if the plague set aside their relationship to God, it did not annul it. We're not talking here. The uh, old reform guys always want to point out that uh, this is one of the reasons why God turned his back on Israel and won't have anything to do with them. Well, that's not true. And uh, Paul clears that up. Has God forsaken Israel? God forbid, he says. No. But the promise of uh, their salvation will come with the day of the Lord. When his return, they'll see him and repent, and the entire nation will turn to him. All right, well, lesson one uh, deals with chapter one, and we finished it early. So I think this will be uh, probably a three, uh, a three lesson thing, or I might find more in, in chapter two, but uh, we'll see. Our Father, you've given us an opportunity to look to your word and understand that the things that happen, the things that devastate the blessings that you have given are not accidental that they have come at your hand. You have allowed it to take away blessings that you have offered because the people have received the blessings but not honored you, have not given thanks to you, have not recognized that it was from your hand. Therefore, they have insulted your gifts of love. We ask that you might help us then, Father, to be among the the rest of the United States, to be those who are filled with your praise, filled with thanksgiving, with words of gratitude. We ask that you might help us then to lead the way to recognize the glorious things that you have done. So guide and direct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.